Columbus, Ohio, by Michelle Alexander, author of the new book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness. Her latest article exploring how the war on drugs gave birth to what she calls a permanent American undercast. It's available at TomDispatch.com. She's a former director of Racial Justice Project at the ACLU of Northern California. She now holds a joint appointment at the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity and the Moritz College of Law at Ohio State University. Michelle Alexander, welcome to Democracy Now! Nearly half of America's young black men are behind bars or have been labeled felons for life. That's an astounding figure. Also, what does it mean in terms of their rights for the rest of their lives? Yes, thanks largely to the war on drugs, a war that has been waged almost exclusively in poor communities of color, even though studies have consistently shown that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs than whites. The war on drugs waged in these ghetto communities has managed to brand as felons millions of people of color for relatively minor, nonviolent drug offenses. And once branded a felon, they're ushered into a permanent second-class status, not unlike the one we supposedly left behind. Um, those labeled felons may be denied the right to vote, are automatically excluded from juries, and may be legally discriminated against in employment, housing, access to education, public benefits, much like their grandparents or great-grandparents may have been discriminated against during the Jim Crow era. Well, you, you mentioned that the, in the war on drugs, four out of five people arrested have actually been arrested for use of drugs, not for possession or use of drugs, not for the sale of drugs. Could you talk about how the, the, uh, both political parties joined in this uh, increasing incarceration around the drug use? That's right. Uh, the war on drugs, contrary to popular belief, was not declared in response to rising drug crime. Actually, the war on drugs, the current drug war, was declared in 1982 by President Ronald Reagan at a time when drug crime was actually on the decline. Um, a few years later, crack cocaine hit the streets in poor communities of color um, across America, and the Reagan administration hired staff to publicize crack babies, crack mothers, crack dealers in inner city communities in an effort to build public support um, and more funding and ensure more funding for the new war that had been declared. But the drug war had relatively little to do with drug crime even from the outset. Um, the drug war was launched in response to racial politics, not drug crime. Um, the drug war was part of the Republican Party's um, grand strategy, often referred to as the Southern strategy, an effort to appear, appeal to poor and working class white voters who were threatened by, felt vulnerable, um, threatened by the gains of the civil rights movement, particularly desegregation, busing, and affirmative action. And the Republican Party found that it could get Democrats, white, you know, working class, poor Democrats, to defect from the Democratic New Deal coalition and join the Republican Party through racially coded political appeals um, on issues of crime and welfare. And the strategy worked like a charm, um, you know, within weeks of the Reagan administration's, you know, publicity campaign around crack cocaine, you know, images of black crack users and crack dealers flooded, you know, our nation's television sets and forever changed, you know, our nation's conception of who drug users and dealers are. And law enforcement efforts um, became targeted on poor communities of color in the drug war. And drug law enforcement agencies, um, state and local law enforcement um, task forces committed to drug law enforcement have been rewarded for drastically increasing the volume of drug arrests. Federal funding flows to state and local law enforcement that boosts the volume of drug arrests, the sheer numbers. Uh, many people think the drug war, you know, has been targeted um, at violent offenders or aimed at rooting out drug kingpins. Um, but nothing could be further from the truth. 
um, local and state law enforcement agencies get rewarded for the sheer numbers of drug arrests. And federal drug forfeiture laws allow state and local law enforcement officials to keep 80% of the cash, cars, homes that they seize from suspected drug offenders, um, granting to law enforcement a direct monetary interest in the profitability and longevity in the drug war. And the results have been predictable. Millions of poor people of color have been rounded up for relatively minor nonviolent drug offenses. In fact, in 2005, four out of five drug arrests were for possession. Only one out of five were for sales. Most people in state prison for drug offenses have no history of violence or significant selling activity. And during the 1990s, the period of the greatest expansion of the drug war, uh, nearly 80% of the increase in drug arrests were for marijuana possession, a drug now widely believed to be less harmful than alcohol or tobacco, and at least as prevalent in middle class and suburban white communities as it is in the ghetto. The populace is mesmerized and hypnotized by powerful behind the scenes forces. As they are distracted by the latest celebrity scandal, the newest cell phone, and their favorite sports team. This network disguises itself, remaining in the shadows. Despite the elite utilizing Bernays' methods, in conjunction with the military-industrial complex they had erected, a modern arm of this organization was exposed in what came to be known as the Iran-Contra scandal. Essentially, black operations were not only caught dealing arms illegally and supporting South American dictators, but also smuggling drugs into the United States. Iran-Contra was really the merging of two different programs. Uh, the first one was support for the Contras, who were, let's face it, a force of terrorists in uh, Nicaragua trying to overthrow the Sandinista government. They were being secretly supported by the CIA, and at the bottom of the whole thing was drugs. Iran-Contra was openly exposed by massive network coverage. How was it that in three years, a network Washington set up to run arms to the Contras wound up running cocaine into this country for the most vicious drug cartel in the world? At the same time, we were supposed to be fighting a war against drugs. But by the same token, I also smuggled my share of weapons in exchange for those illegal substances with the full knowledge and assistance of both the DEA and CIA. Betzner says that in 1983, he flew weapons from Florida to El Salvador and drugs from Colombia to the Bahamas on the way back. In 1984, he says, he flew twice from Florida to Costa Rica and back. We could bring back our own cargo, and they would arrange it, or we could bring back their cargo without ever having to worry about interception, arrest, anything like this, that everything was taken care of. What kind of cargo were you talking about? Drugs. Tolliver says he had two meetings with this man, CIA veteran Rafael Quintero. Then in March of 1986, he says he flew 14 tons of weapons down to Honduras, to this Contra resupply base set up by the CIA. We take off from Tegucigal, Honduras, and we leave. To? South Florida. Where in South Florida? We landed at Homestead. Homestead? Air Force Base. This is the plane Tolliver says he used. The plane traces to a company that had a State Department contract to fly humanitarian supplies to the Contras. In addition to that, three dozen sources confirm the basic scheme. We can now report that long before that operation began, there was another operation to provide guns for the Contras, which was also against the law. In this operation, Americans and Israelis provided arms to the Contras, and then the same network smuggled drugs into the United States. The operation was launched in spring of 1983 at Washington's request with at least $20 million of Israeli government money later reimbursed, we're told, from U.S. covert operations funds. For about five years, uh, people were flying arms into Iran, and most of them came from Israel. The Israelis purchased the weapons from Poland and Czechoslovakia and began shipping them secretly from Yugoslavia to Bolivia and then to Panama. The Israeli liaison man there, this man, Michael Harari, until recently a close aide to Panama's strongman, General Manuel Noriega. You bring the ship into Colombia, you would load drugs aboard it, and you would bring those drugs back to Panama with you. But bringing that stuff into the United States, that was something else. 
I, I've never been so thoroughly disgusted with myself. Welcome That's to the uh, United States of corporate motherfucking America. Redemption. Smith Barney. Merrill Lynch. Bristol Moss. Maytag. Craftmaster. DuPont. MCI. SBC. And they declared a war on drugs. My nigga, they declared war on us. Drug offenders mean more prisoners. And more prisoners mean more prisons built. More wood, more concrete and iron. More trucks, more gas, more iron. Framers, plumbers, electricians. Consultants, advisors, technicians. More guards, more guns. Pass more laws to lock up more niggas and that's more funds. Now they gotta hire more ones. More handcuffs, bully clubs, and stun guns. See, more calls, more CBs, and sirens. Most drug offenders is non-violent. It's all corporate. The state ain't the owner. This prison's brought to you by Tom Warner. Reverse agreement with the United States in terms of what they export and where it comes from. But the mere fact that they say that the, the Tariff um, Act of 1930 that said that we're not allowed to accept prison labor produced goods, you know, um, ex- imported into the country, means it should mean that you don't think it's right. And if you don't think it's right, then you need to look in your own backyard and see what you're doing. Somebody got to drive the buses out to the sticks. Somebody got to make the ink for fingerprints. So these companies, they donate to candidates. Cash for the ones that's tough on crime in their state. More arrests equal more votes. Pass more laws that hurt more Latin, black, and poor folk. Then cut money for education so they can spend more on incarceration. The company that fed your kids at lunchtime now Feed them when they grown, locked them a child line About a half a mil in jail for drug charges It was only 50 thousand before Reagan took office Then he sold guns for dope to the Contras And crack rock exploded in Oakland and Compton Mona gets locked up as expected This prison's brought to you by General Electric It just seems like they're, they're taking advantage because The mere fact that they don't have overhead in terms of insurance and workers' comp and all these other things. You're having, you're getting all these benefits as a result of having the labor. Um, and if you want to say, okay, well, we're training them, we're giving them a skill, we're giving back, it would be one thing. But if you're paying someone 17 cents an hour, that is heinous. It's a come up, a new slave workforce. Just lock these niggas up and make them work for us. And they like to rap about it, that'll work for us. Market them niggas, help enslave a new workforce. Dope and guns, guns and dope. Keep them high, no hope, bro. And in and out of code, it's all profit. From the dope to the locksmith, machine so big, Jesus Christ couldn't stop it, it's a parable. See the Pharaoh, the president, and Jesus came back, they label him a terrorist. I ain't religious, but I read the scriptures from what I read. Jesus would have been banging for us niggas in that stage. And all poor folk on the struck, they can lock me up. But the Lord forgive me for the hustle, cause niggas just on some feet, they keep shit. Living in the system brought to you by big business. I know some of y'all here today because y'all think jail is cool. But see, y'all wouldn't know nothing about that. I ain't cool about jail, nigga. Ain't nothing cool. I've been about here it. 10 years, and I ain't never getting out. Never. I ain't do much. Just kill somebody. Uh-huh. It ain't like the nigga ain't have it coming. He sure did. See, y'all think it's just about us in here. But this is about an oppressive <laughs> up system designed to keep niggas down. And <laughs> y'all wouldn't know nothing about that. What about you, little nigga? You know about that? Yes. Oh, you know about that? Tell me what you know about that. Tell me what you think about that. The prison industrial complex is a system situated at the intersection of government and private interests. It uses prisons as a solution to social, political, and economic problems. It includes human rights violations, the death penalty, slave labor, policing, courts, the media, political prisoners, and the elimination of dissent. Nigga, did you just say what I was trying to say, but smarter? That's the way a private prison works, okay? You pay somebody to build a fancy cage. Then you fill it up as far as you can get it, which is pretty full. Full of people that the people that built the cage get paid forty or fifty thousand dollars a year to just keep in the cage. You have corporations like Wackenhut, you know, they just changed their name, Corrections Corporation of America, that house prisoners, nonviolent drug offenders. As a matter of fact, I think sixty percent 
of the increase in prison population under Bill Clinton, which was like a million people, of the 60% of that new prison population are nonviolent drug offenders. Now, if you've got 5,000 people in your cage and you're being, you're being paid 30, 40,000 bucks a year for them, that's a lot of money. And if you can, on top of that, use them as your private property, as chattel property, that you can then make do work or make produce things that you get paid for on top of that, what a great deal. Now, where I come from, when you transform a person into a piece of property, that's called slavery. Not far from Bakersfield, California, is a small town of Taft, once home to a thriving oil industry. But like so many oil towns across America, the oil finally dried up. Like many bankrupt towns, a private prison stepped in to save the day. The Taft Correctional Institution is owned by the GEO Group, formerly known as Wackenhut. Wackenhut changed its name after a storm of bad publicity. The GEO Group is the leader in providing diversified services to government agencies around the globe. Our global expertise in outsourcing includes the design, construction, financing, management, and operation of jails, prisons, and special purpose institutions, and immigration and detention centers. They trade their stock on Wall Street based upon the number of people that are in jail. If that isn't sick, if that isn't the best definition of sickness in a society, in a culture, in a civilization, I can't tell you what is. How is it that prison labor is being used to make Patriot missiles for big defense companies such as Lockheed Martin and Boeing, getting paid nothing or nearly nothing to do the work and at the same time undercutting wages for everyone else in the country, or some people in the country at least, or so argues labor journalist Mike Elk. He's here in the studio now. So first, Mike, do you think that anybody would ever think that in the United States uh, someone would make 23 cents an hour that that was possible? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a sad situation, but you have, you know, nearly one out of every 100 adults in prison. And prison labor, you know, the, the amendments about slavery don't apply to prison labor. You can pay prison labor just about anything you want. In some states, you're supposed to pay at the prevailing wage, but in a lot of other states, you can pay prison labor as much as 23 cents an hour. And most of the defense material, you know, all those faulty uh, body armor that the soldiers had in Iraq was all made by prison labor. Uh, almost all of, you know, bulletproof vests are made by prison labor. All the electronic components in uh, Patriot missiles are almost all made by, um, the, the wiring is almost all made by prison labor. So then what's new here? Because we've, you know, always heard of prison laborers making license plates or making things that, uh, you know, not Patriot missiles perhaps, but you said this has been going on. So what's really new and concerning? I mean, to me what jumps out is how is this, you know, how are these laborers, these slave wages being paid to people that are producing uh, weapons for private corporations, for huge multinational corporations. Yeah, well, I mean, they're government contracts, so it's, they're allowed to do that. Since so they're that's why, because they're contracts. specific yeah. government contracts. Yeah, although in some states, uh, now there can be made some goods that can be sold in the private market as well. You know, like you have Hange Furniture in Florida making chairs with prisoners making 23 cents an hour, and they're sold at you know, a variety of different stores throughout Florida. So how is that legal? How does that work? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite complex, actually. Um, there's a number of different laws being passed, you know, that have been passed throughout the United States that you're supposed to pay prison labor the prevailing wage, uh, but in a lot of places there's not good oversight, so they aren't paid the prevailing wage. Uh, they never actually get the wage. What happens is, and a big reason why prison labor is expanding, is that there are two things that never get cut when we talk about cutting deficits. The defense budget and the prison budget both have, you know, grown hugely over the last 30 years, and even now we aren't talking about cutting them. And so how do you finance um, prisons and the defense budget? So the obvious answer is you use prisons to help to finance the defense budget. So they pay the, the prisoners, you know, like 20 cents an hour, and then the state gets some of the money as well from the private corporations. And the contractor saves money because they don't have to pay as much. So that's how you keep expanding the two, is you try to use the two. So more and more, we're going to be see prison labor being used as states have a tough time paying for these Well, prisons. yeah, I mean, we see states, too, going broke, and prisons, you know, cost them about $60 billion a year. So this could help defray the cost, too, of keeping people in prison. So in that regard, it could help some of these states that are broke. That is a good thing. Not if it means that states try to keep more people in prison, because what winds up happening is companies like having really cheap labor. 
And if you have so many people in prison, and companies like having those people in prison because they can pay them next to nothing, then that gives just another incentive to keep more and more people in prison. So as that grows, as this industry grows, do you see people uh, from prison lobbies lobbying Congress harder for tougher crime laws and for things like that? Do you see it having that kind of an insidious role? Yeah. I mean, certainly look at what we know about what happened in Arizona with the anti-immigrant bills there. What happened there was that the private prison corporations lobbied for those bills. Illegal immigration had gone down by two-thirds in Arizona, but they lobbied for those bills because if you lock up immigrants, then you have more people in prison. Right. So we're seeing more and more laws like this. That's a good example. And speaking, I want to bring that up because speaking of Arizona, they passed a law uh, where they included legislation to finish their border fence, and they had a website to get donations and that to finance that, and they said that they're going to be using prison labor to help defray the cost. An event in Payson last week when the head of a state goes on national television and, and says things like headless bodies in the desert. I mean, no, would you... I'm not going to comment, I'm not, I'm not gonna comment on that anymore further in regards to that, but I will tell you, it is the responsibility of the governor to speak to the public and tell them what is happening in Arizona. we got a terrible problem with drug cartels. According to all of the information we have, Arizona is safer today than it's been in years. And how come you're not getting that message out? Although tourism is taking it on the chin, there is one business that stands to gain tens of millions of dollars from tougher border security and the implementation of measures like SB 1070. It's the private prison system. In Arizona, Corrections Corporation of America, or CCA, holds the federal contract to house detained immigrants. It's worth more than $11 million every month. And that figure could grow exponentially with more immigrants picked up off the streets. Our CBS 5 investigation found two of Governor Brewer's top advisors have connections to CCA. Deputy Chief of Staff Paul Sensenman was a lobbyist for the company. His wife is still a registered lobbyist for CCA. Brewer policy advisor Chuck Coughlin owns High Ground Public Affairs, which also represents CCA. Did Paul Sensenman or Chuck Coughlin have any input with you on signing SB 1070 into law? Okay, we're done. I mean, are you aware that they are they were lobbyists for Corrections no, Corporation yeah, of America? Sorry. Sorry, Morgan. Governor, don't you think you should have disclosed that? The governor did not answer those questions. I think any honest observer of American racial history has to acknowledge that the rules and reasons the legal system employs for enforcing status relations evolve and change as they're challenged. In the first chapter of the book, I describe the cyclical rebirths of racial caste in America. Since our nation's founding, African Americans have repeatedly been controlled through institutions like slavery and Jim Crow, which appear to die, but then are reborn in new form, tailored to the needs and constraints of the time. For example, following the Civil War, a new system of control emerged to replace slavery called convict leasing. That effectively re-enslaved enormous numbers of people. And what that was all about, what that was rooted in, was that the southern economy, and in a way the American economy, right. was addicted to slavery, was addicted to forced labor, and the South could not resurrect itself. And so there was this incredible economic imperative to bring back coerced slavery, and they did on a huge scale. You say they did it by criminalizing uh, black life. Of course, before the Civil War, there were slave codes, there were laws that governed the behavior of, of slaves, um, and, and, and that was the basis of laws, for instance, that made it where a slave had to have a written pass to leave their plantation and, go, and travel on an open road. Well, immediately after the Civil War, all the southern states adopted a new set of laws that were then called black codes, mm -hmm. and they essentially attempted to recreate the slave fact, code. The prison system contains obvious vestiges of slavery. Right? The 13th Amendment abolished slavery for all except those who are being punished for committing a crime. So in a lot of ways, what we see in the penitentiary system in this country is the continuation of the system of slavery. Well, I believe our criminal justice system has been used once again to effectively recreate caste in America. Now, I'm sure there's at least one person probably more, in this room who's thinking, what is she talking about? Our criminal justice system isn't a caste system.
system. It's a system of crime control. The black folks would just stop committing so many crimes, they wouldn't have to worry about being rounded up, locked up, and stripped of their basic civil and human rights. And therein lies the biggest myth about mass incarceration, namely that it's been driven by crime or crime rates. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. Our prison population quintupled in 30 years, went from about 350,000 to well over 2 million for reasons that have stunningly little to do with crime or crime rate. So what does explain this explosion in incarceration, in black and brown incarceration in the United States, if not crime rates? Well, the answer is the war on drugs and the get tough movement the wave of punitiveness that washed over the United States. In fact, drug convictions alone accounted for about two-thirds of the increase in the federal system and more than half of the increase in the state system between 1985 and 2000, the period of the drug war's greatest escalation. Now, to get a sense of how large a contribution the drug war has made to mass incarceration, consider this. There are more people in prison and jail today just for drug offenses than were incarcerated for all reasons in 1980. Drug convictions have increased more than 1,000 percent since the drug war began. Drug prohibition for cocaine was basically passed in order to protect white women from black males. And, and the, the history will document this. Talking to people in the ghetto, one dealer's name always came up when talking about crack's popularity. Freeway Ricky Ross became known as the Walmart of crack. Ricky's story has become as legendary as Tony Montana and Scarface, but with an even more bizarre twist. Ricky, who is currently serving time in the Texarkana Federal Prison, is scheduled for release in 2013. The prison denied me access with a camera, so I started interviewing Ricky over the prison payphone. You know, a lot of people don't know what it's like to, to, to come in, uh, uh, in a house and there's nothing to eat. You know, to go to a supermarket and, and, and walk through the store and, and eat out of the cookies and, and, and things of that nature just to have something to eat. Cocaine came along, you know, and gave me a new horizon, <laughs> I would say. There's a new epidemic. Smokable cocaine, otherwise known as crack. I remember clearly one day in the late 80s, every single news network simultaneously running an identical news alert about the new, incredible, powerful, unbelievably cheap drug that was to sweep the nation. This is crack cocaine. Soon, every single black person living in the ghetto would sell his own mother for another hit of crack cocaine. It was like watching a strategically engineered ad campaign. Talk about perfect product placement. Did we mention it's cheap and strong and very addictive? It's only $5 now, so stay away from it. Let there be no mistake. This stuff is poison. Crack cocaine epidemic. Crack, 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 crack cocaine epidemic. Few street-level dealers have ever reached the legendary status of Freeway Rick with distribution that rivaled many Fortune 500 companies. Freeway Ricky Ross was a young, aggressive, savvy, streetwise marketer uh, who started selling cocaine and then suddenly some major sources opened up for him. At the height of Rick's operation, he had over 40 full-time employees in Los Angeles alone. He had cook houses, cash counting houses, rock houses, decoy houses, and even a house he lived in. Cooking was always our most vulnerable and our most time-consuming uh, uh, thing to do. Usually you could put it in uh, like a big Samsonite suitcase. You could put 100 keys just about in one of those, or maybe two of them. So that's what, that's, that's what we normally cook every night, like 100 kilos. Rick shares some good down-home cooking tips about rocking it up. Well, the way we did it is I, I basically was a chef. You know, I, I did all the stirring. I would tell the guys to mix. Like one guy, he would be standing there, and I would tell him, add more baking soda, uh, pour more water, you know, that type of situation. So it was, more, yeah, it was like an assembly line. I know this is nothing to joke about, but Rick is your all-American opportunist. And as the media told us, crack was now the big new opportunity. You know, we had houses where you basically would uh, 
go up to the window and, and it would be served right out the window, kind of like the way McDonald's does it, I guess. Because we had uh, houses in so many different locations. Basically, you know, I wanted a location. I wanted it to be convenient for the, for the people, you know, where they wouldn't have to drive for. It was kind of like marketing, I guess you would say. The gangs evolved and the gangs were a great business venture. They're basically marketing tools. That's, that's really what they were. Uh, and they were quietly promoted behind the scenes. They got a lot of money, uh, they got a lot of power, they fought for drug turf. Everyone's working for somebody else right now, legally or illegally. There's a, there's a, there's a fine line. Between love and hate, you see, came way too late, but baby, I'm on it. There's a fine line between love and hate, you see, came way too late, but baby, I'm on it. Can't wear it back, what a nigga thing to see, and that's liberation, and baby, we used to, back during the Vietnam War, we used to talk about the military-industrial complex. Well, now you have the prison-industrial complex. And you have what um, is the ultimate um, solution to America's economic problem. Those who are poor, those who are powerless, those who have no access to the wealth that one needs to survive, and I, you know, perhaps wealth is, but the resources one needs to survive. Uh, in an area where um, there is corporate downsizing and there are no jobs and there is only a service economy and education being cut, which is the only rung by which people can climb. Um, the only growth industry in this part of Pennsylvania, in the eastern United States, in the southern United States, in the western United States, is quote unquote corrections, for one of a better word. The corrections industry is booming. The thing that absolutely tore my guts up, the thing that took my heart and tore it apart, was at 9 o'clock in the morning, not that I'm sitting in jail, for what I do not know, but I've been in that jail cell all night with uh, Mr. Cook until he started bringing in all the prisoners from the other parts of the jail. And everybody is black. Everybody, with the exception of Mr. Cook, is black. It's one of the most emotionally devastating things, as you see them herd like cattle. All of these kids, all are black, every last one of them. A devastated potential. Herd it into this pen like cattle. When they take you out, you have these white jailers who come in with these massive sets of chains. The chains must be like maybe four foot sections with double handcuffs. And you, you just... There is an ancient nerve that is obliterated by the sight of white men chaining black men.
in long line to cane. It's, it, it, you could see it. It was a slave ship. I mean, all the rest of it, no, nothing. Nothing doesn't mean a thing to me. I am not free, I know that. I know that before I finish doing this video, you, any cop that wants to can make up any story they want to, and every jury, every judge will do it. I've got nothing. I must admit, they planted a lot of things in the brains and the veins of my strain. Makes it hard to refrain from the host of cocaine, from them hoards from the flame, from a post in the game. Makes it hard to maintain focus, then from the Glock rounds and lockdowns and burials. The seeds that sow get devoured by the same locusts, cause it's a hard road to hoe. If your ass don't move, and the rain don't fall, and the ground is dry, but the roots are strong, so some survive. To your surprise, now I watch their cries. You got more juice than Zeus, slanging lightning, trying to frighten Flames dwellers of the Serengeti, but get beheaded when you fall to dread it Melanin, silicone, and collagen injected The second my pride, who the one gon' get it started? We be the lion hearted, without it fantasize It's like that red sprite, you can't imagine Unless you're looking at the canvas of life Not through the peephole of mortality, single-minded mentality Getting over on the poles, getting paid twofold on technicalities Clicking your heels, scared to voice how you feel, clapping still Picking cotton from the killing fields with no total. I don't think we in Kansas, no moto. Midwest, a dirty south. Clean dress, a dirty mouth. Whether robbing preachers or killing poor righteous teachers. You a scared demon. You shouldn't be allowed to spread semen. Jeff Blackburn witnessed how the lure of lucrative drug war funding enticed an entire police force to make illegal arrests. All of a sudden, overnight, there was this massive roundup, well publicized, all put all over the TV stations, where. Uh, One-tenth of the town's black population was uh, escorted in handcuffs to jail. We were told that this was the most massive rural drug conspiracy ever uncovered uh, in West Texas, that it was due to the sterling police work of an individual cop named Tom Coleman, who is a hero. The Toy newspaper ran, not an editorial, I'm sorry, it was a news story that was headlined, Tulia streets cleared of garbage. When all the major media sources, including 60 Minutes, covered the Tulia story, they told of a lone redneck cop by the name of Tom Coleman who hated black people. But who was Tom Coleman working for? When you follow the trail of money, he was merely a pawn of a law enforcement policy that profits from making large arrests. So there was this thunderclap arrest and sweep of the black community. I landed 46 people in jail, uh, nearly all of whom were black. Then, of course, they quickly started getting processed through the system with court-appointed lawyers, with all-white jurors, and we began to get sentences like 99, 75, 320 years, out of control, over-the-top, Texas, typical small-town sentences for drug dealers. Yeah, I sat in jail for five months before my lawyer even came to see me. He told me, he said, only thing you can do for me uh, give me uh, 25 to 99. In the olden days, uh, you had legal lynching. This was, uh, this was legal lynching on a whole new level. This was ethnic cleansing uh, combined with the need to get grant money. The problem in Tulia and the problem with most of the task forces in the state of Texas, they're created as an entity, as a as a corporation that more or less stands it alone. It's not in the chain of command of DPS or any state agency. It's tempting to think of Tulia as just some rural weird remnant of the distant Deep South past. The truth is, Tulia is the cutting edge of modern drug law enforcement. And you got this task force out here operating like a pit bulldog or a Rottweiler that's supposed to be on kind of a leash, but it's running all over town trying to find any kid it can to bite. Yeah, I know I was single out because I was black, an you know, old black guy. And the Spanish and the black, we, we in big, big it's a ploy. Well, this drug money funds terror, it's a ploy. Ploy. Uh, a manipulation. Ploy. Drug money funds terror. I mean, why should I believe that? Because it's a fact. A fact. F-A-C-T fact. 
So you're saying that I, I should believe it because it's true. That's that's your argument. It is true. Since 9-11, the only thing that's really changed around here in my neighborhood are the attitudes of the police. You know, the gangs are now the new terrorists. And how tough security's gotten since 9-11, it's like really like, you know, how the drugs coming into the United States now, how? I mean, you know, I don't have an airplane, you know, I don't have a car that's gonna make it with California place to Mexico and back to uh, Colombia. I can't yeah, even drive to Colombia. Yeah, so it gotta be I don't have a boat. It gotta be flown or ship. There's a great line in the movie Boys in the Hood where Larry Fishburne is saying, hey man, we don't grow it, we don't own any airplanes, we don't have any laboratories, how does it get here? Why does it get here? And that's a very good common sense approach that intuitively the people in South Central understood, but there was something much bigger than them uh, that was moving the whole drug issue and the drug war. My parents were staunch Republicans. Back in the 80s, the big concern was not terrorism, it was communism. The Iran-Contra affair was one of the biggest political scandals in U.S. history. Members of the Reagan administration, headed by Oliver North, engaged in the sale of arms to Iran. The proceeds from these illegal deals were being used to fund the Contras, a right-wing guerrilla group that Reagan referred to as his freedom fighters. The Contras were fighting the Soviet-backed Sandinistas for the domination of Nicaragua. The Iran-Contra is very important in history. We have to remember the fact that Iran-Contra, its mandate was to investigate the sales of missiles to Iran. Former DEA agent Celerino Castillo not only fought in the international effort of the American drug war, he also had the rare opportunity of carrying a camera and recording some of the regrettable actions of the DEA and CIA while they supported President Reagan and Oliver North's Contra movement. George Bush Sr. came to Guatemala on January 13, 1986. And he approached me and asked me what I did uh, there at the uh, U.S. Embassy, what my job description was. And I told him I was a DEA agent working uh, uh, international narcotics investigations. And I told him, look, you know, we have gathered intelligence that the cartels are involved in drug trafficking down in El Salvador. And then he just smiled, shook my hand, and, and walked away from me. And it was then and there that I knew that my government knew that these atrocities were occurring. They were so concerned about giving the guns to Iran and all that stuff. The question should have been asked about all that cocaine flying back over, over here. In 1986, on American TV, we were all being fed a steady diet of... We're taking down the surrender flag that has flown over so many drug efforts. We're running up a battle flag. This scourge will stop. But regrettably, back in Central America and in the jungle... I remember down in Central America, we were refueling planes full of cocaine coming into the U.S. And uh, it was a CIA uh, operation being run by the White House. At the same time, all of the cocaine from Nicaragua was flowing into the U.S. Freeway Ricky Ross was at his heyday. The average week would at least be two to three million dollars. Almost guaranteed. Some days we would have two and three million dollar days. After Freeway Rick was arrested, an investigative journalist by the name of Gary Webb uncovered a link that connected him back to the Nicaraguan Contra movement. So I read Dark Alliance. I got a, a, a copy uh, personally from Gary Webb himself. And to read the book, it, it, was, it was fascinating for me, you know, to find out that I was connected with the CIA and, and all these high powered people up in the government. Ricky Ross was just lucky. He just happened to get a source who was connected to the CIA. For a long time in South Central, the buzzword was that the CIA was selling crack. I said, no, the CIA wasn't selling crack. The CIA was importing cocaine. Ricky Ross got it, turned it into crack, and he sold it. According to Gary Webb's Dark Alliance, when Danilo Blandone was displaced from his home country of Nicaragua, he set off to America to raise money to aid the Contras in ridding his home from the invading Sandinistas. When Ricky Ross was introduced to Blandone, Blandone was in a position to create a pipeline of cocaine that he in turn gave to Ricky Ross on consignment. Which I like the sound of that, you know, because I was always trying to get to the top anyway. Suddenly, some major sources opened up for him. Danilo Blandone, Norwin Meneses, both of whom were tied to the CIA and the Contras, and Gary Webb did a masterful job 
of uh, breaking those stories and proving with documents that that was the case. Whatever we were running in LA, it was the profit, it was going to the profit revolution. I started doing a little research on my own and I read a little bit about Oliver North and the Contras because I never knew what the Contras was before. There's ledgers of, uh, of Oliver North and them actually transporting the cocaine to our country. There's fear. Every piece of document that's possible. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. First time dealer and former Crip, Leroy Chico Brown was arrested with Rick. Chico walked into a DEA sting operation that was set up to capture and imprison Rick and trade for Rick's old partner, Danilo Blandone. How could this be possible? And then we read through the documents, and then that's when Gary Webb started explaining it to us, and we was like, everything came together now. One of the most paramount moments, perhaps caused by Gary Webb's Dark Alliance, took place in November of 1996. It was a monumental historic event. I mean, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency was coming to Watts to face the people. Now, we all know that the U.S. government and the CIA supported the Contras and their efforts to overthrow the Sandinista government in Nicaragua in the middle 80s. Now it is alleged the CIA also helped the Contras raise money for arms by introducing crack cocaine into California. Deutsch felt he had to do something to try to uh, deal with the outrage that was foaming all over the country at the time. And of course, it just blew up in his face. CIA fights drugs. CIA does not encourage drugs. I mean, it was, it was actually one of the most monumental blunders of all time, uh, if you think about it. We have no evidence of a conspiracy by the CIA to engage in encouraging drug traffickers in Nicaragua or elsewhere in Latin America. Deutsch was there because of the Gary Webb stories. The Gary Webb stories had sparked a national furor. I would like to have Richie Ross's uh, brother to speak, please. The United States government turned their head and let this cocaine come into the United States of America. Allow Gary Webb to have full access. This whole thing is orchestrated. It was near pandemonium. It was about, I guess, 1,200 people in standing room only in the auditorium. 2,000 people outside listening on loudspeakers. And uh, it was very hard to keep control. I got called on finally, and I said to her very clearly, I was talking, looking right at Deutsch. I am a former Los Angeles police narcotics detective, and I work South Central Los Angeles, and I will tell you, Director Deutsch, that the agency has dealt drugs throughout this country for a long time. Uh, I was able to name operations. Director Deutsch, I will refer you to three specific agency operations known as Amadeus, Pegasus, and Watchtower. I have Watchtower documents heavily redacted by the agency. I was personally exposed to CIA operations and recruited by CIA personnel who attempted to recruit me in the late 70s to become involved in protecting agency drug operations in this country. He stumbled and stammered and wrung his hands. If you have information about CIA illegal activity in drugs, you should immediately bring that information to wherever you want, but let me suggest three places. The Los Angeles Police Department. And of course my response was, I started there 18 years ago, sir, and they tried to kill me. Now what do you want me to do? If this information turns up wrongdoing, we will bring the people to justice and make them accountable. The crowd started chanting, we told you, we told you, we told you. And it was a great moment of unity. And it was a healing moment for me, because I'd been out alone for 18 years and didn't really know that, that that kind of support was there for me either. The average person in South Central Los Angeles did not know anything uh, about really how the CIA worked. They had an intuitive sense. If you have a private network run by George Bush and Ali North, not the CIA, you won't find the records in the CIA. They're not there. They're in these private privatized intelligence agencies. Will you pursue that? Will you pursue Ali North and George Bush and the, ever, the massive documentation? All these gentlemen, like this gentleman here, the co-defendant of Ricky Roth. They needed the money to finance the war in Nicaragua. They had to leave. We know that from records now that they sent Blando, who was a CIA operative, CIA, to school for marketing. Marketing the product, which we now know is cocaine. Me and Ricky Ross is waiting to get sentenced Tuesday. 
And she go, what, what, what a judge gonna say to us come Tuesday? Uh, may I just say that the uh, question which was asked of us by the judge was, was Ricky Ross ever a agent or a contract employee? I already knew that from the beginning of, of, of dealing with Danilo Blandon that he was sending supplies and things of that nature, computers and guns to Nicaragua to fight a war. Ricky had already served a five and a half year sentence for dealing crack, but was now given a second 20 year sentence after being set up by his former partner Blandone, while Oliver North walked away as a hero, wealthy and free to try his hand at politics. Oliver North was uh, being promoted by the Christian Coalition, and to them he was the last white hope that uh, they were going to have for a right wing um, Christian to run for. U.S. Senate in Virginia. During the 1986 Kerry Commission, Oliver North's crimes were exposed to the American public. And yet today, Oliver North is not only a free man, he has his own show on the Fox News Network. It's amazing that uh, Oliver North has his own TV show, and, and hopefully when I get out, I plan on having my own. How does a federal agency like the CIA exert control over local law enforcement agencies? The way it's done, uh, which I saw firsthand at LAPD, there are networks called the Narcotics Intelligence Network, or now it's called Clearinghouse, where agencies who are doing a drug case don't step on each other's toes. Every time the police go invade us, I know Rick used to get calls and say, uh, move out, you know, they coming. We actually saw that here in 1986 uh, with major task force investigations of Freeway Ricky Ross. They had search warrants for 19 locations that were prepared one night, and by the time they got there the next morning, all 16 locations had been cleared out. Uh, and that means that obviously there was a leak. That's the way the CIA protects its share of the drug trade. Uh, just one night, uh, I got a tip from Danilo not to go over, and uh, just so happened to be the night that they raided. Crack use spread like wildfire in the early 1980s. And in Los Angeles, a drug dealer known as Freeway Ricky Ross was in the middle of it. Prosecutors called Ross the Walmart of crack. He made millions in the early 80s dealing to Los Angeles street gangs. The United States Sentencing Guidelines and the federal sentencing system uh, rewards those who get others involved in criminal conduct. And that's what Blandone did. During the exact same period that Freeway Ricky Ross was at his heyday, home values in South Central Los Angeles were tanking. People owed $100,000 on their home. The place was a war zone, dead bodies in the backyard, prostitutes in the front, drive-by shooting. I mean, it was horrible. And people walked on their mortgages because they couldn't sell the houses. Uh, and tens of thousands of homes were moved, literally for 10 and 20 cents on the dollar after people abandoned their mortgages. We call that ethnic cleansing. There was a greater plan to, to, to put churches, to put liquor stores, gun shops, uh, and, 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 and cocaine, drugs, into the ghetto, into the neighborhoods, and draw the prices down. And they pretty much did a good job of that. Real estate in, in California, which what we consider Compton, Watts, East LA, South Central, where the drug infested gang killing the highest rates in the country, and families really start moving out of the inner cities to way out, I'm talking about 70 miles out of LA, to get rid of, I'm talking about the foreman when they promising people that they're gonna build up sit jobs and everything. Especially like in, in, in the 80s. There's a big thing about moving to the Marino Valley. You're gonna have all these big corporations come in. It never happened. People actually moved out there, end up losing everything because the big corporations never came. And then a lot of investors came back here and start buying property for so cheap, cheap prices. And now the property value is sky high. You can't even afford to live in Compton and Washington World without spending $300,000 for a home that my mother then paid $9,000 for. It won't always stay the same. It doesn't always have to be this way. Don't underestimate what can happen in these prisons. You know, we think of just people hold up and they're not going to do anything. That's not true. They get inspiration from us, and we get inspiration from the kind of organizing that they can do inside prisons. You know, there was a time when people thought there would be no way that Jim Crow could ever be brought to its knees. But a major social movement did arise. Uh, that managed to do precisely that. Well, we've got to do it again.